you remember last Monday, what happened on Monday? How many of you remember? This, this town went crazy, right? We went nuts. So two million people, they say, had gone downtown. I mean, for what? They think like they thought they won some lottery or something like that because they didn't win nothing. Sorry to be so skeptical. But, you know, it was their team. And it was just a breakthrough of just a couple of dozen individuals, if that, that had caused such an amazing, positive impact of joy in a city. Throughout the country also, from coast to coast to coast, they say. And I know how big of an impact it was because when I was spending time with my mom, she's sitting right there, so I'm going to embarrass her. So I took her out on Monday, so we have lunch together, you know. She actually took me out. So we had lunch together, and on my way, I couldn't believe my ears that she could not stop talking about basketball. <laughs> my mom! How many of you know my mom? And she will be having a conversation about, oh, I look at the coach, you know, I see the strat strategy. Like, what is this? What possessed my mom? What happened to my mom? The impact was amazing. But it was just a breakthrough of just a couple of dozen people that brought joy and tremendous impact to our city and in fact our nation. They say that it was... The, it was it, it was it's one thing that had united our country at the at this moment. From coast to coast, people are celebrating Canada. We the North. All of a sudden, we the North. Right when they were losers a few years ago, that's no we at all. But now they're winners. Yeah, we the North. Yeah. But praise God, it is we. See, it's just a few dozen, a couple of dozen people. It's it was their breakthrough. You know, I know, I know one guy, Ka Ka Kawhi, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Kawhi, 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 Kawhi Leonard. You know, I know it was one guy, he had done this before, he had experienced breakthrough, he had an NBA title before, but for the rest of the guys, all new frontier, all new breakthrough. Some guys are young in their early 20s. It was an amazing breakthrough for them. But yet we all felt it. You felt it. And some of you are crazy enough to go downtown. You certainly felt that. My, my brother-in-law from Waterloo, I'm just going to make fun of him. He, he actually went down, downtown and he almost got stampede over. Because there was a shooting and people started running and he didn't know the news. And he was saying, I saw a sea of people running towards me. So he said, I did not know what happened. I kept, I, I, he said, I thought to myself, if I don't start running, they're going to stampede me over. So he started running with them. Didn't know what was going on. And then after a few minutes, he realized, what am I running from? You know, <laughs> that was the problem. But anyway, so people, all, oh, everyone was impacted because of the breakthrough of this couple of dozen guys. You know, throughout history, every scientific breakthrough, every medicinal or medical breakthrough or engineering breakthrough by one, two, or three individuals had also brought tremendous impact in millions of lives even today. Let me give you a few examples. Polio, the discovery of the cure of polio. So many decades ago, and somebody discovered that there is a cure for polio and the whole planet was changed because of that one discovery, one breakthrough by one scientist. And same as leprosy, maybe not one scientist, a group of scientists, you know. These individuals, they were studying and working hard and contending for, contending for. And then they had a breakthrough and the whole world got changed. How about old Canadian Frederick Banting? For those of you who are diabetic, you know who that is. Because he discovered how to isolate a certain insulin in the body. And so that now he can bring cure or at least bring some sort of, some sort of normal, good quality of life for many millions and millions of people. But it was his discovery. It was his breakthrough. And yet millions of people was able to get the benefits of their breakthrough. And how about the Wright brothers? You know, the Wright brothers, they were contending for the fact that, you know, just a blip in the air as a transportation is not good enough. They, they try to figure out how it is that they can use the principle of aerodynamic to maintain an object to be in the sky. 
They didn't know it was the aerodynamics that was the term, but that it was. They, they tried to discover. They, they go through all kinds of trouble using all their own money, their own cash. There's no funding from some agencies. But they were so convinced that there is more than just blips. They're so convinced that there's more than just traveling by boats. And so they went and discovered this amazing discovery. And today all of us are impacted. You know, they say the city of Toronto is full of, full of, full of people from all over the world. Sitting here in this room, there are people from all over the world. How many of you came with boats? You did, eh? Wow, look at that. Well, come on up. That's a sign and wonder right there, you know. No, <laughs> you know, wow. But most of us came with airplane. Yes? Praise God, you know. It changed our life. It brought us to this country. And it brought the world closer together. Now you can go to England. You can go to, you can go to, you can go to Philippines. You can go to South Africa. You can go to whatever. Just, just in a few hours, you'll be able to get there. Some of them are more than just a few hours, but you know what I mean. But the discovery and the breakthrough of this couple of bro- this two brothers. That's all it is. Two of them. Just trying their own thing. Change the world. Change your life. Changed my life. But more importantly, there had also been many spiritual breakthroughs by individuals or group of people that had brought transformation in, hu- in the history of mankind and humanity from the first day till now. Because of the spiritual breakthrough of these individuals, we are all enjoying what we're enjoying. One of the most incredible big breakthrough actually is Jesus' death and resurrection. It was an internal and spiritual breakthrough that had brought salvation and healing to countless of lives throughout the last 2,000 years. It was his breakthrough that now you are reconciled to God. It was his breakthrough that you don't need any law anymore to be reconciled to God. It was his breakthrough that you have great grace in your life. It was his breakthrough that no matter, you know, how, how, how horrible your past is, if you're willing to repent, the Father has his arms wide open waiting to love you and to receive you. It was his breakthrough. One person. That we all become benefactors. Of that breakthrough. And it was his breakthrough that opened the ways for the Holy Spirit to come and fill the, the disciples. And it will fill with the power of God. It was his breakthrough. And it was the breakthrough of the Holy Spirit that now believers can now go around and, and healing the sick and pray for people and expecting miracles. It was their breakthrough. Waiting in the upper room. Contending. Waiting. Contending. And the Holy Spirit came and changed the world and since that time there have been waves and waves and waves and waves of breakthrough now think about this if there were no spiritual break there was no spiritual breakthrough in the history of humanity the world was not going to be the way that it is would not be the way that it is sin would still be rampant there will be all kinds of killings you know in the old days before jesus came life was quite worthless you remember you know if you know some history you know um, people are okay with each other people are okay with human killing each other right in front of them as entertainment called gladiator people are okay to throw a live human and allow animal to eat them alive right in front of them it was okay but Jesus came he changed the world now life is worth something because of the spiritual breakthrough. If you study the history of human society from a spiritual perspective, most positive impact and changes, if not all, were the results of great spiritual breakthroughs by a group of people, by an individual, and that breakthrough brought an amazing seismic secular shift in society at large even in the modern day history if you study revival i'm one of those guys to study revival all the time you know if you don't know what that term is don't worry about it it means that there's a spiritual awakening i call it spiritual breakthrough this morning <clears throat> you know if you if you study the history <clears throat> even the modern history there's all kinds of spiritual breakthrough that had led even north america 
to become the way it is. In the old days, you know, in the, in the days of cowboys, you know, you know, people were shooting each other. There's just this, this lawlessness and chaos. But if you study the history of the church, the spiritual history, you would understand and familiar with the term of the first awakening in the 1800. And then followed by the second awakening and the Azusa Street Revival, the charismatic, the charismatic Revival, the Healing Revival, and all the different renewals and revivals throughout, literally throughout the history, just for North America alone. Because of that, we are where we at. I really believe it's not politics. The world will tell you it is democracy that is working. Try that in Iran. That's not true. It is spiritual breakthrough. The most recent one is, I don't know if you've been to New York. Some of you are too young to be in New York in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s. You know, I remember when I uh, graduated from university and, you know, I graduated in 1991. So it's early 90s. So I was, you know, part of a company. They sent me down to, to a conference in New York first time, you know. And the, the city was still going through changes. But it was at the tail end of the changes. But it's still, you can see a lot of sins there prostitutes just everywhere and peeping uh, shop everywhere and and you know you want to be careful in walking to places in certain places in New York but these days you go to New York it's actually quite peaceful you can go anywhere I think we just came back from New York and we, my wife just loved it she's like oh I love you New York I love you New York New York it's, it's peaceful it's fun it's, it's less dollar and a lot of people thought it was Mayor Giuliani I don't think so. Most people don't know. In the 70s, when gangster was ruling the streets and, and drugs and prostitution was rampant in New York City, God called a man from a small town in Pennsylvania by the name of David Workerson. He called him up. This guy had never ministered in a big city. He called David Wilkerson up, go to New York. And here he went with no money in his pocket. If you know the story, some of you know the story. And he started to do the work of ministry. There is a spiritual awakening. One gangster after another starting to get saved. There was a big tide turning. Now he almost died for many, many times. But it was a spiritual breakthrough that changed New York. History won't tell you that. Certainly the media will not tell you that. They will tell you it's politics. It's whatever they, they want to attribute to. But it's one man, obey God, went to the jungle as it were and saw an amazing spiritual breakthrough. Throughout the history of humanity, there was always breakthrough by one individual or a group of people, as I said. But every now and then, after the breakthrough, in between breakthroughs, humanity would drift back into sin. If you were to study the Old Testament and New Testament, you know, in Judges, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, you see that. You know, people of Israel, they are the foreshadow of what God wants to do on earth. And so when they got into the promised land, you know, every, every now and then they would drift back to worship idols, commit sin. And every time when that happened, you know, the enemy will come and oppress them, rob them, bully them, kill them, you know, all kinds of chaos were going on. And then every now and then God will raise up a judge, a leader. To cause a spiritual transformation. People will repent. The nation of Israel will repent and they come back to God. And as they come back to God, God will prosper this nation again. Prosper the, the king, well not the king, prosper, prosper the leaders. Prosper everybody. Prosper their land. Prosperity came. Peace and order came. But then again, in between time, as I said, they would drift back into sin and then again oppression come. I think we one of those seasons that we're in between spiritual breakthrough. And that's why when you look at television, you go, what am I supposed to do with this? This is a pride week, pride month. I don't know if you know what that is. And sin is rampant. They're lifting up sin and say, this is okay. This is perfect. And righteousness now is supposed to be politically, politically incorrect and therefore is damned. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to? What are we supposed to do? Like I say, in every generation... God is looking for a group of people. And today as I speak, I pray that God is speaking to some of us, if not all of us.
was stir in us. Something that we didn't have before. You know, when the city and the nation are in a place where there's no spiritual breakthrough by believers, yes, we are in. You will see a lot of report of crimes, abuse, you know, you know, you heard me say this, mention the statistics. Over 70% of men in the city had been abused, whether sexually, physically, verbally, whatever. And, and, and there are more assaults, more murder, more social injustice, more injustices that we, have, we are witnessing. So, so what do we do? What do we do? There are three things we can do. Number one is we can be passive and give up. You know, we can say to ourselves, this, this is too big of a deal. I just, well, what, how do we start? How do we even go get going? This is too big. This is not just a Toronto thing. It's a nation, national thing. It's an international thing. It's too overwhelming. It's almost like, you know, facing a Goliath 10 times over. It's huge. So many Christians have decided to be passive. To say, ah, may the Lord's will be done, Shaka. We just go to church, do our thing, praising Jesus, getting blessed. Nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you who's going to pay the price. The next generation. Some of you have already witnessed that your next generation is already paying the price. How can not be paying the price? They're in a very toxic environment that hate God, that hates God, rejects God, and, 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 and renounce God. So it's too high of a price to pay to be passive. Then what do we do? Do we get involved in politics? You know, as a pastor, I receive all kinds of email from everyone and their mother about getting involved in politics. This week alone, I have three invitations to get involved in some kind of politics and dialogue or whatever or protest. But I think politics is not the way to go. Because we have seen even born-again Christians who become the head of this country. He, was, he, he wasn't able to do much. The abortion law is still, is still not there. People still can't get an abortion. And, you know, same-sex marriage is still available. You know, it's, people can still do that. And, and you know, just this, what, what, have, what has been done? And besides that, even if he was able to do that, it is not the best way to preach the gospel by ramping down your code of morality into somebody else's life. We're believing in mercy and grace and the goodness of God that leads to repentance. By forcing your moral code on other people does not help anyone. But bless God for the people who want to get involved in politics and whatnot. Just praise God. But I don't think that's an effective way. We can be angry and protest. Do all sorts of those political things. They're ugly. They look angry. But I want to propose this. May the Lord call a few people from this room this morning to a place to seek His face, to seek again for a new spiritual breakthrough. You know, Isaiah 41, 43 verse 19 is an eternal statement. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This was a statement that God has uttered to the generation when Isaiah was in. It's an eternal statement because in every generation, God wants to do this. But he's looking for a group of people to partner with. Why? Because only human beings have the authority on earth. Because he has given us the authority to rule the world. We may have sinned and ceded the authority to the God of this world. That would be Satan himself. But you know, after the redemption, we are redeemed back. And so therefore, we can partner with God to see new spiritual breakthrough as this word has prophesied. My point is this. In every generation... God is looking for not everybody, but a few people or a group of people that are willing to contend for the spiritual breakthrough. Let me tell you this. If you are a parent, you should contend for a spiritual breakthrough. Because it is only through your spiritual, not them, your spiritual breakthrough that they will see breakthrough. Like the basketball players, like all those scientists that had a breakthrough. We are the benefactors of it because somebody was willing to contend. In the spirit, it is us believers. So as a parent, I need to contend for a spiritual breakthrough for my household, for my home. 
And as a church, we need to contend for a spiritual breakthrough, not for a church, not for a bigger church, but for the sake of the city, for the next generation, and even for this nation. And that's what we're called to do. Come on. So we need to contend for this spiritual breakthrough. And you don't need a lot of people. We just need a few people. Now I'm going to share with you the three conditions that you will see any sort of breakthrough, whether it's spiritual, financial, whatever. You know, this principle I'm going to share, the three points I'm going to share, it's a principle that is true even for your, for your situation right now, your personal situation, whether it's spirit, physical or spiritual, you know, whether you're, you're struggling financially, in relationship, in marriage, in whatever. That if these three conditions are met, you're set to have a breakthrough. But I want to focus on the spiritual breakthrough because as a pastor, as a, as a spiritual leader, my focus is on the spiritual breakthrough. Not just for me, but my breakthrough is for your breakthrough and your breakthrough, our breakthrough together is for our community and our city. You know, you cannot preach people and scare them to become Christian anymore. How many of you have tried to preach to your children? Are you here this morning? And how did it work out for you? And you realize that the more you talk to them, the more they're going to resent you. Especially those that was in, they were in church with you at one time. Preaching is not going to work anymore. Being passive is not going to work either. You and I need spiritual breakthrough for the sake of our children and our children's children, for our generations, for this city. But this three condition has to be met in order for you and I to have breakthrough of any sorts. Number one is that you and I need to realize that where we are at is not good enough. That you know there is something better, something more. Spiritually, I'm talking about spiritually. You're thinking of your finances, whatever. Where you at is not good enough. There is more. You know there is more. You believe, you're absolutely convinced there's something that is better. If you are sick, you need to know that there is more. You can actually get healed. You need to realize it is true. You cannot take the report of the doctor as a final statement saying that there is no cure for you because if you take that as a final statement, there will be no breakthrough for you. You need to come to the place and say, no, I don't believe that because I know something better is available for me. Come on. It's the same thing spiritually. Spiritually, if you think that this is enough, what we do every Sunday is good enough. What we do every Sunday, come into church, sing a few songs, listen to a preacher, you know, and then go to a cell group. And, and if that's good enough, then you won't see any breakthrough. You and I won't see any breakthrough. If we think that it's, it's, it's good enough that, you know, oh God, our, parents, our children just know God, you know. They may not be serving God, but as long as they know God, it's fine. If you think that it's good enough, then there'll be no breakthrough. You need to be absolutely convinced that it is not good enough. It's way not good enough. It's very not good enough. I don't know why I'm making, no, I'm making no grammatical sense, but you understand what I'm saying. It's not good enough. Spiritually, it is not good enough. Because we have seen it. We heard the glory of God. We heard of the fame of God. And we're not seeing it. Is it enough for you? Is it enough that you have a nice home and a beautiful car? I mean, praise God. I love that too. But is that enough? Is that the reason why you're sitting here? I, I, I beg to differ. I think in your spirit, some of you in your spirit, you know there is more. And there's a cry. There's a draw. There is an appeal into your spirit for more. And that's why you're sitting here. I didn't come and force you to sit here. We're not part of a denomination that makes you feel guilty if you don't show up. Are you here this morning? You came willingly. You came wanting more because you know there is more. That's the first condition is that you need to be convinced that what you have is so not good enough. Second condition is that you will not accept the status quo. You know it's not good enough, but many people have accepted the not good enough. It has become okay for you. 
Some of you are contending for healing. You've been praying for a while. Nothing happened. You've accepted it. You've tolerated it. But if you've tolerated it, you won't have any breakthrough. Same as morality. Same as the spiritual condition in this city. May I propose to you that many of us believers are okay with the current situation. We know it shouldn't be the way it is. But we have tolerated it. Because we don't know what else to do. We say it's okay. We say to ourselves, it's okay, I guess it's all right. It's all right that, that our educational system is, is, is full of agenda that is so opposing to our value system in the Word of God. It is okay that, that my children is exposed to those things. It is okay that our politics are corrupt. It is okay that, that finance, the commerce is corrupt. It is okay that it, you know, people are getting killed every day, shooting gun violence. I guess this is okay. We've tolerated it. It is okay that the agenda of the world is just sweeping through and that we can't even speak our mind. We can't even stand up for who we are because that is politically incorrect. I guess it's okay. Well, if you're okay with it, nothing's going to change. God is looking for a group of people who say, no, it's not okay. It's not okay that I just get some few revelation and do some Bible study. I mean, they're all great. They're good stuff. And come to church and have some good music, good lights, you know, and, and good smoke. You know, and, it is not okay that we do this every Sunday, every week, every week in and week out, and nothing changes. We're comfortable. We're very comfortable. We've learned to accept it. I want to tell you this. If you accept where they're at now, don't kid yourself. They're not going to stop there. Are you here this morning? Sin will never stop. If you skip sin a yard, he'll take the whole football field. If you say it's okay today, guess what he's going to do tomorrow? And for many years, for too long, believers have been telling ourselves, it's okay. It's fine. It's not your battle, man. Just take it easy. Enjoy life. Enjoy the summer weather. But I propose to you it's not okay. It's not okay that our children are not serving God. It is not okay that our children have turned away from God. I'm not telling you to go to scold them. That's not the point here. But there has to be an amazing tension in our spirit to say it is not okay as opposed to accept what is okay. It is not okay that many people are getting abused still today by the hundreds in our city. It's not okay that teenagers are hiding in the dark to cut themselves because nobody understands the pain they're going through. It's not okay that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not being preached. And while thousands of people are going straight to hell every single day because they have never heard the good news, all they heard is religious gospel. And so they've rejected it. It's not okay that we're still in sickness. It's not okay. We cannot be okay with that. Until we are in the place where we say, no, it's not okay, there will be no breakthrough. It's not okay in our educational system. I cannot accept that. You know, it's all pastor, you send your kids to private school. But it's not okay because I have relatives, I have friends, and for goodness sake, my kids will be interacting with all those kids that's going to be coming out from those educational systems. Oh, it's not okay. I want to encourage you parents, and this is by no means a word of condemnation. It doesn't. But you know this. It is spiritually speaking, our children is always two steps behind us. Two steps. Maybe even five steps. Sometimes we have to be so radical in our breakthrough just for them to be, be faithful believers. Because I tell you this, if, 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 if you expect your children to love God more than you, <laughs> you have to be so radical for the sake of your children because they're going to be a few steps behind you. I don't know if I confuse you. Did I confuse you? So we need to be willing. I, but I, I guess if it's okay, that's fine then. But it's not okay. It's not okay drugs is rampant in university. It's not okay that marijuana is free of, you know, it's, marijuana is be free to use. It's not okay that people are getting hit by drunk driver and, and people are under influence. It's not okay. 
Let me ask you this. What is negotiable to you? Because whatever is negotiable for you, you will not have breakthrough. Until you say this is not negotiable. My faith is not negotiable. My time with God is not negotiable. My priority God is not negotiable. Unless it's negotiable, unless it's not negotiable, it will always be a place where you won't see breakthrough. Put it another way. If you want to see breakthrough, then things that you want to see breakthrough should not be negotiable. It's not on the table. How far are you willing to go? You know, let me tell you this. And please, I'm not here to offend anybody. Every time I say that, you know something's coming, right? When there's no spiritual breakthrough, we become petty. We fight petty wars. We fight things that are differences, nuances. One reason why in churches, <laughs> there's so many wars, fractions, people get hurt so much leaving church, this, that, and the other thing, is because there's no spiritual breakthrough. Spiritual breakthrough is not hearing a good sermon. Are you here this morning? Many people, they gone to a great conference, they came back, they have all kinds of revelation, they thought it's a breakthrough. That is not a breakthrough. Spiritual breakthrough, spiritual awakening will change society. You see crime is less. There's a precipitous drop in crime. There's a precipitous change in society. That's spiritual breakthrough. You having a revelation is you and yourself. It doesn't do anything. I love revelation though. I keep seeking it. But I know that's not a breakthrough. But because we don't have breakthrough, we chase after petty things and we fought over petty things and we have petty wars with each other. Who can blame them? Because there's no breakthrough. Because we're already okay. You know, we look at all the denominations over the years. They were all monuments of the mighty move of God. Each denomination. Don't mock them. Don't, 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 don't mock them because they are monuments of the move of God of past. You celebrate them, but you learn from them. Because for many of those denomination they were the moves of God and they were the moves of God that had stopped because everybody is now content they're not fighting for more we're in the danger of that in this generation believers you want your next generation to serve God you better be three four five ten steps ahead of them because if you just you're just doing the regular thing for example, if you come to church once a week, they will come to church once a month when they grow up. I'm, I'm, it's just, it's not a formula. It's just, it's just they all, they always will be a few steps behind you. That's why they call you a leader. You lead the family. So it's not enough. It's not good enough. It's not okay that my children are not serving God, it is not okay that my relatives, my young ones, my nephews, my nieces are not serving God. I'm not saying my, I'm just giving an example. It's not okay. So first is realize where you're at is not good enough. Second of all is that you cannot accept where you're at and you will not accept. And number three, the final one. Worship team, can you come up? You and I are committed to do whatever it takes to see spiritual breakthrough. No, I'm not trying to start a program. There's no new programs going on in this church. You say, what is it that we need to be committed to? I don't know. You have to hear from God. I have to hear from God. Lest we're being manipulated by people who see our desire for breakthrough and try to coerce us for their own agenda. Are you here this morning? So I don't have any plans. I don't have any, any specific things for you to sign up. The purpose of this preaching is so that God will stir such a hunger in us for breakthrough that all those things that we're concerned about, the petty things, is not important anymore and that we will contend. Contend for what we know is there, is available. The more that is available, the bigger that is available, the, the more awesome that is available. You know why? Because your breakthrough and our breakthrough will bring changes to the world around us. In other words, the world around us is waiting for you and I to have a breakthrough. 
Your children is waiting for you to have a breakthrough. Your kids, they may have grown up doing their own thing, you know, reject God. What are you going to do? Talk them back to church? We all try that. Oh, words can't do anything. Words will not do a thing. You and I need to be in a place where we say it is not okay. I want the next level of breakthrough. What is it you're contending with this morning? Are you contending for your family? Are you contending for the city? What are you contending with? I will propose to you that whenever you have breakthrough in what you're contending with, lives will be changed. Lives that you may not even know today. Would you please stand with me? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this. Look, end with this. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open to you. The third condition for us to have breakthrough is we need to be committed and be persistent. When we read the scriptures, in some of those translations, we always misunderstand it as whenever you ask, boom, it will happen. Whenever you seek, boom, it will happen. Whenever you knock, boom, it will open to you immediately. The word keep on is the key. What does it tell you? It's a process. It's a lot of patience required. It's a lot of persistence required. I was talking to this coach, basketball coach, you know, that my son has been part of the little team that my son has been part of. He's, he's from another church and we sent our son to, to that team because we didn't have any basketball thing and we're trying to create one right now. Hallelujah, Sean. Yeah. So, but, but before then, you know, like, uh, we, you know, we, so my son, got, and the, the coach, he's a volunteer. He had been doing it for four years and he has a full-time job and a family. But he committed his entire Saturday to reach out to young people. That's four, 40 people that he was reaching out to. You say, oh, you know, he has no family. He has a family. And he come visit. He visit all the basketball players. Bring them their trophies. Talk to them. Spend time. This, this guy. And he was telling me. I said, you know how? Are you full-time? He said, I'm not full-time. I said, how many people are doing this with you? He said, oh, pastor, I've been wanting to give up four years. Every single year I want to give up. Because every time when I start, everybody say, oh, I'll help you, help you, help you. And then three months later, the help kind of fizzle away. Sean will know that. Praise God. And then, you know, and then, they, and then they're trying to get involved, the parents involved. And they're excited for three months and they fizzle away. There is no commitment. There is no longevity. But he, of course, stuck around. And he started with a few kids, now I have 40 kids, and he's looking for more co laborers. And I was shaking my head and saying, you know, isn't the Bible true that the harvest is white but the laborers are few? Because not a lot of people are willing to contend for any breakthrough. Keep on asking. Keep on the keeping on, they say. 